10 scenes that completely outclassed the movies they were in. Batman vs Superman is a weird movie. When it came out, everyone hated it. Then, gradually, a lot of people came to its defense, and it settled in this place where the public opinion on it is that it's just kind of weird. Which it is. It's partly a superhero film. It's partly a deconstruction of a superhero film and of superhero characters. It's got this kind of gritty drama vibe mixed with an almost like political sensibility. And thus, your mileage may vary quite a lot. And depending on where you stand and the kind of person you are, you could see this movie in several contrasts interesting ways. But the one thing I think we can all agree on is that it's it's slow. The overall pacing, the ponderous vibe, the action, they're all slow. Except for this scene. The actual Batman vs Superman fight was one of the most depressing moments of my life. It looked like two tired old people whacking away at each other in an asylum while the caretakers were away because both of them thought that one stole the other's flat cap. And the truth is there was no flat cap. It's all in their heads. Just like the manufactured conflict in this film is all in the film's head. Very weak, poorly thought out, and poorly applied. Same with the build-up scenes and the pondering and the peach tea and the gloomy faces. It's like trying to run a hundred yard dash with super glue on your trainers. But all that heft disappears completely during this scene. And I bothered with all that setup beforehand because it's important to realize that this is not just a good action scene. It's like this is now an entirely different movie. For the duration of this one scene, we have stepped into a high octane, high stakes, absolutely thrilling Batman movie where the Dark Knight gets to showcase what only this film and the Arkham games have ever managed to do, which is how Batman would realistically fight and triumph against so many opponents. The pacing is absolutely relentless, the choreography is excellent expertly done. The tools and gadgets make this look like an actually believable fight that Batman could believably win. And even the no-kill people have to admit that they like this scene. Because right or not, it fully expresses the rage that's barely contained behind the surface of this character. And that rage is there. Batman spouts the word vengeance one too many times for that to not be the case. So this scene for sure outclassed its movie harder than probably any other. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box and you die. What's in the box? What's in the box? Dune 21 is also a weird movie. For all the praise that it gets for its visuals, its cinematography, its artistry, and its general pretentiousness, it gets just as much hate for being a big pile of nothing that ends with a cliffhanger, and then part two also being a big pile of nothing that ends with another cliffhanger. If you've read the book, you'll realize that a lot of stuff is missing. A lot of dialogue in particular. Dialogue, inner monologues that add context and characterization to most of the cast, as well as just interesting scenes that are completely excised from the movies. I'm looking at you, banquet scene. So it can often be pretty hard to get into the movie's purely visual style, but the one scene where it's easy to do that is the infamous box scene. Every single thing about this scene is brilliant. From the framing to the decorum to the way the characters measure each other up, to the symbolism behind it all, the tension that it effortlessly evokes with not but a few words, the brilliant acting on display. Opening with this scene sets the tone perfectly for this gripping universe. The subtle dog whistle that can be heard when the pain starts Starts, just like a tingle before stranger and stranger sounds get added to the mix. Shamble Babe's acting, the way he twists his hand to the side of the box, ever tempted to remove it, his facial expressions like he's almost like in a trance of pain, and the way he suddenly changes into something else, into this figure described in all the foretellings and prophecies. Pulling that off exactly as described in the books, it's all pretty brilliant. I'd say the only thing that sours it is Jessica's schizoid episode that's way overdone and overselled, like she's going through childbirth, and some much more reserved acting would have been more appropriate. Something that still lets us know that she's concerned and that Paul's in real danger, but nothing quite so manic. But otherwise, this is one of the only scenes in both films that actually delivers on the promise of Dune, as far as I'm concerned. That promise being an experience that does a lot with very little, that can make political intrigue a nail-biting experience, and where just two characters staring at each other can fill the room with dread and tension. Whether you think this Dune adaptation is good or bad, the box scene outclasses the film it's in all the same. Wars are fought with weapons, but they are won by men. We are going to win this war because we have the best men. And because they're going to get better. This is less of a scene and more of a character part. Tommy Lee Jones as Colonel Chester Phillips is one of the best things about this film. His casual swagger, his comedic timing. Go get him. 
The first Avenger threatens to devolve into a dreary affair as it is, hmm. but if you remove this character, then it really takes a nosedive. Do you know how long it took to set up this project? All the groveling I had to do in front of Senator what's his name's committees. Right, yeah. Only then do you realize just how much color this one character puts into the film's cheeks. You brought a 90 pound asthmatic onto my army base. I let it slide. I thought, what the hell? Maybe it'd be useful to you, like a gerbil. <laughs> Look at that. He's making me cry. Excellent character and one of my favorite small roles from the entire MCU. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? I've paid you a small fortune. And this gives you power over me? The Dark Knight Rises gets a lot of hate. First of all, because it's a flawed movie, but secondly, because it had the misfortune of being a sequel to The Dark Knight, a movie that even today, many years after its release, makes everyone go, oh, oh. But that aside, The Dark Knight Rises is objectively a mixed bag. There's lots of good scenes and there's lots of bad scenes that you could point out, but there is one scene that showcases the level of quality that this movie sometimes possesses. And the really important other thing that it accomplishes is it aptly showcases how much of a terrifying badass Bane can be. I'd argue that this is on par with the Michael Jai White How I Got These Scars scene. Same amount of menace and intensity. Bane says like three words in this scene, and yet those three words are enough to shift the entire power dynamic between these two characters in a very believable manner to the audience. That do you feel in charge moment should be one of the most prolific overused memes today. Oops. That's right, a second scene from this film. Anne Hathaway is far from people's favorite Catwoman, myself included. I'm not gonna argue with that, but one thing I can argue is that this is one of the best possible ways to introduce Catwoman on screen. First of all, because you'd expect Catwoman to be first seen in costume, not out of it. Well, I mean, you'd definitely like to see her out of it. But also because it's such a slow burn organic of a reveal. Hathaway does an excellent job of playing the clumsy, confused, scaredy cat maid, and if we hadn't seen the trailers or the casting for this movie beforehand, she would have fooled us too. But not Batman, who immediately knew that she was up to no good, and then what's truly going on slowly dawns on us, leading to that iconic... Oops. Where the subtle way in which she completely changes her gaze and her demeanor is just so goddamn good. Excellent performance, great scene from start to finish. I'm gonna give Peter the, uh... The dad talk. I thoroughly dislike this movie. I'm not gonna waste any time explaining why because I already did in two videos. Watch this and this and write a full essay about my essays by Monday. There's a lot of stop and start in this movie, there's a lot of slice of life, there's a lot of dead time, but one of the few scenes where it really gets going and I lean forward in my seat to pay attention is this one. Now, of course, the odds of Peter Parker walking into the car of his arch nemesis are ridiculous, but that's par for the course for Spider-Man stories. And just like the Catwoman bit, this scene unfolds so organically, with Keaton's character almost falling asleep at the wheel from disinterest, to then noticing that something's up and watching Peter like a hawk until finally realizing the awkward situation that he's in. Once again, the key word here is tension, like in so many of these scenes, and the ability to create tension without fights or explosions is key. In fact, big fights and explosions don't usually create tension, especially nowadays, so you can do quite a lot with quite a little, and this scene perfectly showcases that. Tasm 2 is the dumbest fucking movie I've ever seen. If I had to choose between watching Tasm 2 again and getting a rectal exam, I'd be like, <laughs> so little of this film is redeemable. I can't actually think of any one scene that's good, except this one. The moment of Gwen's death is the only moment that makes you forget all the dumb shit you just saw and just stare intensely at the screen. By this point, I was so fucking over this film. I wasn't invested in this Spider-Man and this relationship with Gwen and anything, yet the slow-mo, the framing, the excellent acting, and yes, even the cheesy CGI sprinkles on top, managed to squeeze some emotion out of me. Now, doing that in a vacuum is impressive enough. Doing that at the culmination of the train wreck that is this film is godlike. One of the best death scenes in all of cinema history, I don't want to hear another word. Hey, buddy, it's okay. Hey. It's all right. Ah. Hey, look. Just a normal guy. 
people really hate this movie. This isn't Spider-Man, they say. He's too pretty, he's too tall, he's too much of a douche. He makes me question my sexuality. I don't like his suit. I don't like the overly edgy setup and the drama and the vigilantism. But all of that is exactly why this scene is so good. Because up until this point, it's not really a Spider-Man film, true. And that's intentional. This is where it becomes a Spider-Man film, because this is where he becomes Spider-Man. And I think it was important to double down on that rage and that vigilanteism, because that's when the transition to a true hero really shines. It makes the contrast that much more powerful. Spider-Man has to abandon his quarry in order to save a life. He has to reveal himself to this kid. He's naked, exposed, vulnerable. He gives his mask to the kid to calm him down and inspire him, which is symbolic for Spider-Man giving himself to New York, to the people. It is the one true baptism of Spider-Man. It's the only scene I know of that does this to this degree. It's also a very organic way to come up with the name. Who are you? Spider-Man. definitely the time to click off the video moment of this video. This is less of an endorsement of the scene execution, but rather the scene conception, because the Martha idea is actually valid, believe it or not. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but the idea of a name or a face being enough to completely derail and 180 a character is not far-fetched at all, and I could point to many other examples that do the same, most notably off the top of my head, Castlevania. Spoiler alert for the show, you should definitely watch it, but Dracula is so fucking far gone in that show that he's willing to kill his only son. Nothing even makes him blink out of that state until the fight accidentally takes them to the kid's old room. It's not even a name or a face, but a place that manages to briefly snap Dracula out of his madness. It's a moment that works extremely well because it was built up to properly and it was executed properly. Now, the Martha moment from BVS was built up to properly, but it wasn't executed properly. The screaming, the blurting of the word Martha, the stupid fucking out of left field lowest exposition, it all has a first draft of the script stench upon it and should have been iterated on way more. Like in the Dracula scene, this kind of stuff works much better with introspection rather than expression and rage. Superman could have been wobbling and crawling and limping for his life, delirious from the wounds he sustained and just mumbling, save her, please save her, save my mother, not really trying to fight back or save himself anymore, accepting his fate like a true man, the very thing that Batman said he was not. And then Batman pins him down, readies the final blow and says, you have no mother. And Clark, in his delirium, just whispers her name is Martha as he starts to lose consciousness. And Bruce doesn't yell, he doesn't lose his shit, he just stands there, pondering what he just heard as images of his mother flash briefly before his eyes. He slowly lowers the spear, he looks at it, he looks at his hands, he looks at himself, and then throws it away. Or it could have been a picture of Martha, it could have been anything, but the broad point is, uh, don't yell. Now this is kinda about the Kid Clark scenes as a whole from Man of Steel, as they all kinda build on each other, but this scene is the culmination of it all. Sure, it's kinda brief, the setup could've been a bit longer, but the idea of the scene, the conception, the impossible situation that Clark was put in, the score, gods, the score, and the total abandon with which Clark chooses to potentially reveal himself to the world right then and there, it's all brilliantly conceived and directed. This kid is absolutely amazing in this role, and these childhood scenes, basically tease a Smallville-like teenage Clark Kent movie that we never got, and I'm forever gonna be salty about that. Anyway, these are the scenes. Pick your favorite, your least favorite, add your own scenes on top of them, and don't forget to like. Special shout out to two other heroes, Serhi Shishin and Longthorn, for sponsoring the channel.